Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back to part 3 of Rocks Part 2. So before we go any further, let's just quickly get the code word out of the way. The code word for this presentation is BANANA, I repeat BANANA, like the yellow fruit. So that's B-A-N-A-N-A. -N -A -N -A. Please write that down, put it somewhere safe because you're going to need it for the code word quiz. So now we're going to come on to uh, chemical sedimentary rocks and the first ones we're going to think about are the chemical carbonates. So the carbonates we were just talking about are the result of, or should I say talking about in the previous video, are the result of biogenic processes. So that's an organic uh, process which causes carbonate to be removed from water. So for instance, you know, an animal developing a shell or an animal accidentally having carbonate nucleate onto its body through a passive process. Either way, there's a you know, either way there's life involved in the process. Now, in the case of chemical carbonates, what we have is we have a process that does not require life at all. All that happens is, in the case of a chemical carbonate, is we just need to get the right set of conditions to cause the calcium carbonate that's dissolved in the water to come out of the water, so exit solution, and crystallize out to form solid crystals. So. Seawater and most fresh water are pretty much saturated with calcium carbonate. So, you know, for instance, uh, you might have heard the term hard water. That's a, a, that's a term that's commonly used for, you know, fresh water that's extremely rich in dissolved calcium carbonate. So, in some instances, things like high temperatures, high pressures, or high salinities, you can actually dissolve more carbonate in your water than you should normally be able to. So this is called supersaturation. So uh, a good example would be if you take a glass of water and you start putting teaspoons of salt into it. Now I'm sure you know you can put teaspoons of salt into the water but eventually you'll get to the point where the water can't dissolve any more salt. So in that case your water is now saturated with salt. However, if you take that glass of water with the salt in it and you put it on a hot plate and you heat that water up slightly, what you're going to suddenly realize you can do is you can actually stir in even more salt than you could before. So you've actually got, you've actually managed to dissolve more salt in your water than you would normally be able to just by heating it up. And so at that point, your water is now super saturated with salt because you have dissolved an excessive amount of salt in it. The same thing goes for the carbonates. <clears throat> if you can get your water to have the right chemical uh, conditions or you know the, the right uh, pressure, temperature, salinity, etc., then you can uh, cause that fluid to dissolve more calcium carbonate than it should be able to. So then all you have to do is you just have to you know put that supersaturated water into an environment where you can encourage that excess calcium carbonate to come out of solution and crystallize to give solid crystals. So the kind of processes that actually drive this uh, precipitation of calcium carbonate from supersaturated waters, typically driven by things like decreasing temperature, decreasing pressure, maybe some kind of fluid mixing, you get two different waters mixing together and that can encourage the calcium carbonate to come out of solution. or you can also have, in some instances, interactions with organic material. Okay, but that's organic material, not in the kind of active sense. It can be uh, you can have a um, a carbonate-rich water, for instance, that comes in contact with uh, dead and decomposing organic material, and that could encourage the calcium carbonate to come out of solution. So there are quite a few ways that we can encourage this calcium carbonate dissolved in the water to come out of the water and precipitate out to give us solid crystals. So if your calcium carbonate is in a warm or hot water, when that calcium carbonate comes out of the water and you know, begins to precipitate out as solid crystals, it will form a rock which we call travertine. So this is an example of the type of environment in which we would find travertine forming. So here we have an area where we have warm calcium carbonate filled waters coming up from the subsurface, so below ground level. And as that calcium carbonate rich water moves towards the surface, the temperature begins to drop. As the temperature gets lower, well, all of a sudden the water start, can't carry as much calcium carbonate dissolved in it. <clears throat> so as the water temperature drops, 
the water has to start getting rid of that excess calcium carbonate. You can see it's doing doing that by you know precipitating precipitating out the calcium carbonate in the form of calcite crystals. And you can see them here. You, know, you can see these you know nice white rocks here. That's all calcium carbonate precipitating out from the water. Now, if however your calcium carbonate is coming out of solution and that water is a cold water, you're actually going to form a type of rock which is referred to as tufa. And here you can see some uh, tufa uh, columns. This is uh, Mono Lake in California. Tufa is a little bit more difficult to form, and you know that there are a few ways in which you can make it come out. But you know, I'm not really going to go into fine details. I'm going to be honest. But just you know, just know that travertine is when you have dissolved calcium carbonate coming out from a hot or warm water and tufa is the result of when you have calcium carbonate precipitating out from a cold water or should i say an ambient water the kind of water you would get on the surface of the earth under normal conditions now in terms of uh, other chemical sedimentary rocks we have the evaporites we've already touched on those we, yeah, i mentioned them right back at the beginning so the evaporites are formed when bodies of water enter a restricted arid environment so you have a body of water in a dry environment and obviously that's going to cause the water to evaporate into the atmosphere now the problem is is as that water goes from the liquid to the gas uh, gaseous form it can't take the stuff that's dissolved in it with it so you know if your if your sea water evaporates away the water goes into the atmosphere but the salt that's dissolved in that seawater can't go with it. So what happens is, is over time, your body of water you know, essentially get, you know, has less and less water in it, and the amount of salt, for instance, gets higher and higher and higher. And eventually the, the uh, concentration of salt in your water would become so great that you would begin to start crystallizing out salt crystals from your water. So that's the basic principle of evaporites. You have a restricted body of water, in a dry environment and you're losing more water from that body of water than you're having put back in. So the classic example would be somewhere like the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea straddles the border uh, between um, uh, Israel and Jordan and uh, what you have is a situation where you uh, have a body of water in a dry very arid environment so lots of evaporation but the River Jordan that flows into the Dead Sea is not bringing in enough water to compensate for the water lost due to evaporation. And so that means over time you have a net loss. And so over time what's happening is the Dead Sea is steadily becoming more and more water poor and what's happening is, is the water is becoming more and more concentrated in the stuff that you know can't go with the water when it evaporates away. So if, if you've ever been to the Dead Sea, you excuse my dog, by the way, if you've ever been to the Dead Sea, um, you'll know that the water is actually extremely dense. You can literally lie on top of it without, you know, sinking because there's so much dissolved material in there. It's so salty and there's so much other stuff in there like calcium sulfate in the water that it actually makes the water very, very dense. And so you're, it's actually quite difficult to sink in it. It's actually a really good video, if you want to find it on YouTube, where someone actually uh, throws a bowling ball into the Dead Sea. And amazingly, it actually floats because the water is that dense. So in terms of evaporites, well, you can have two different types of water evaporating away. You can have marine water, otherwise known as salt water, the kind of thing you get in seas and oceans. Or you can have non-marine water, so fresh water. And because these two different types of water have slightly different chemistries, they're going to produce slightly different uh, evaporite rocks when they evaporate away. So in the case of marine evaporites, well, what are you going to get? Well, to start with, you're going to get significant amounts of carbonate, gypsum, so gypsum's calcium sulfate, and halite, that's salt. So once you've evaporated away about 50% of your water, that's the point where you're going to start seeing ca uh, carbonates precipitating out of the water. Once you've evaporated away about 80% of your water, that's when the calcium sulfates begin to appear, gypsum and anhydrite. And then once you've evaporated away 90% of your water, that's when the halite starts to precipitate out. Now, when you're dealing with fresh water, fresh water does contain, you know, carbonates, it does contain carbonate, does contain gypsum, and it does contain halite. So when you, you know, evaporate a, uh, a fresh water, you will also get these minerals 
uh, produced as part of that process. However, you also have additional minerals appearing in a freshwater evaporite system. So yes, you'll get the halite, you'll get the gypsum, you may even get some carbonate, but you'll also get other interesting minerals like uh, uh, groups of boron minerals. So someone like borax, the kind of thing that's in laundry detergent, that's an evaporite mineral produced by the evaporation of, of uh, fresh water. And you know, you might get other minerals like uh, epsomite, also you know, known by its term, known by the general term epsom salts. And so non-marine evaporites will give you the, these minerals, but it'll also give you some more interesting accessory evaporites as well. In the case of marine evaporites, they will typically just be dominated by the carbonates, the calcium sulfates, and the salts, you know, m mostly uh, halite. So just to give you uh, an example of the types of environment, so this is uh, Death Valley. And this is Badwater Basin here. This is actually a, a lake that forms uh, on the uh, the bottom of Death Valley. And you can see you have this kind of, you know, creamy yellow white material here. These are the evaporites. So um, you can see you've got high ground. So there's high ground over here. There's actually high ground off to the left of the image. And so during the winter, you get, you know, you get a little bit of snow and ice forming on this high ground. And then in the spring, of course, what happens is the snow and ice melts. The water comes off the high ground and, you know, gathers in Badwater Basin here. So for a short period of time, you'll actually have a, uh, a body of liquid water here at the, you know, in Death Valley. And then, of course, that water will evaporate away and it will leave behind the minerals you know, that were in the water. And obviously, this is fresh water. So you're going to have a mixture of salt and you have a mixture of calcium carbonate. You're going to have some calcium sulfates in there. But you're also going to get other minerals like borax in there as well. Over here, this red line marks out a, a very, very large um, uh, layer of uh, evaporites. Uh, this is called the, uh, the Zechstein. So this was a body of water kind of about the same size as the modern day Mediterranean. And this body of water, which is called the Zechstein Sea, uh, was around in the Permian. Okay, so, you know, let's fragment, say, let's, let's say, you know, 300 million years ago. And what happened is, is this, you know, this Mediterranean sea-sized body of water became isolated. It got cut off and it got cut off in an arid environment. And so obviously what happened is the water evaporates away. But the, the things like, you know, the calcium sulfate, the calcium carbonate and the salt can't go with it. And so what ended up happening is you ended up forming huge, thick sequences of these evaporite minerals across this entire area here. And... Just to you know, just to show you here. So these are actually uh, some of the mines. So this is um, uh, St Kinga's Chapel in Poland. So these are salt mines. And what you have here is you have a situation where this is a stope. So this is the room that's been mined out to extract the salt. And obviously you're left with this uh, this you know you know rather cathedral-like space. And so what happened was is the uh, the miners during their lunch hours, they would obviously sit in these uh, stopes, they would eat their lunch. And now the thing about salt halite is that it's quite a soft mineral. So you can just, you, you know, you can carve it with your knife. And so what ended up happening was is, is these miners would, um, during their lunch hour, they would just, you know, carve away. And eventually over time, some of these stopes became quite intricate. And they're now actually a tourist attraction. You can see they've put in electric lighting. And, you know, if you ever get a chance to go there, they're, you know, they are pretty cool. So anyway, so that's it. It's a nice short video, not too much to uh, really discuss when it comes to sediments. They are relatively straightforward. But uh, in a couple of presentations time, we're going to start talking about environments of deposition. And this is where we're actually going to really start thinking about, you know, what we look at when, you know, when examining a sedimentary rock and exactly how we interpret that information to give us the environment in which the sediment was deposited. OK, so please make sure you don't lose that code word. Once again, the code word was banana. And uh, right. See you soon.